Okay, well, welcome back um, after our short break after Raymond. Um, but to, to stay on schedule, I'm going to move right on forward. Um, our next speaker is Brian Whipker again from North Carolina State University. Um, he is going to be talking about uh, Snow Princess Lobularia, um, tips and troubleshooting. Um, before we, I get into that, again, I just want to thank Proven Winners for their support for this webinar so that we can offer this uh, webinar to all of you for free. Um, if you have any questions or comments for Brian, um, please type those into the, uh, the chat section on the bottom of your uh, um, control panel. Um, if you don't have the, the handouts and you want the handouts, you can click on the materials tab within the control panel and download them from there. Um, we're going to be recording this, so uh, this will be available to you after um, a, a week or so when we can get this up on the eGrow website. With that, um, Brian, can you confirm that uh, we've got you on the, uh, um, on the microphone? Okay. Hey, there we go. I'm, I'm switching over to headset number two. <laughs> so I believe... How's that? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, let me just check the settings real quick, and it's showing that it is ready. Okay. Uh, yeah, technology is a great thing, <laughs> as long as it works. So I want to talk about, uh, in this presentation, we're going to talk about lobularia. And a few years ago, there was a uh, uh, request by Proven Winners to look at this plant because there was some trouble that some growers were having. And so we wanted to explore what were the causes of those problems. So we did a series of experiments. So what are, what are we talking about when we're looking at this? What, what we're talking about is that the plants were having lower leaf yellowing issues. So you see the plants normally growing, but then around the base you had lower leaf yellowing. In addition, you know, Snow Princess, you know, it's a great plant, but man, it can be vigorous. So how do you kind of control some of that growth so it doesn't really go wild on you, especially if you have a wet spring and you have to hold that plant? And then finally, when you're looking at things, you know, it has such a high irrigation demand that when it gets pretty darn big, the problem comes in that it tends to end up wilting on you. So how do you control some of that irrigation or is there anything that needs to be done? So, so we had those situations of the lower leaf yellowing. We know it's a vigorous grower and it has those high irrigation demands. So the questions were, how do we prevent that lower leaf yellowing from occurring? How can we manage the growth and how can we improve that water use efficiency for that particular crop. And so to do that, we did a series of experiments. And so first, you know, what do you think about? What, what causes lower leaf yellowing? Well, the first thing that comes up is you're, you're gonna think about nitrogen deficiency. And so um, the, um, the, um, uh, so you get lower leaf yellowing occurring on that plant. And so um, you, you start seeing the lower leaf yellowing that's occurring with, with the growth of the plant at this point. So I, I, Brian Krug, can you hear me talk? I can, yes. Okay, uh, I, I thought there was a a little slowdown on this end, so I wanted to make sure we weren't having a computer problem. So, okay, lower leaf yellowing. So we did the experiment. We grew it in our nutrient deficiency system, and you can see it's that silica sand there, no nitrogen, so we clearly got lower leaf yellowing. But also notice on the plant on the left in particular, when you have lower leaf yellowing problem, and because of nitrogen being limited, the plant size is also small. So it does occur, but you're gonna, you're gonna for a diagnostic key, you can look at that lower or that lack of growth to help diagnose the problem. The the other situation that occurs is that, uh, or what we wanted to look at was that let's look at nitrogen rate. Then, if there is some lower leaf yellowing, what's the optimal level of nutrition to end up using? And so. 
we grew the plants in 5-inch pots and we fertilized them between 50 and 400 part per million with uh, a nitrogen-based fertilizer from Proven Winners. And so this is what we got. So look at that. So you can see that the plants are slightly smaller with 50 part per million. It grows up bigger at 75. You really maximize your growth at 200. And then when you get too big into a normal response curve, when you start getting the nitrogen rate around 400 parts per million, the plant is actually smaller. So you can see there about the relative growth. So if you're more of a host cell grower, you might want to lower the fertility slightly. So you can use that, that lack of fertility to control growth. Or if you want to maximize it, then you can go to a higher rate of fertility like 200 parts per million. Now, one way to see whether or not the plant's actually using that nutrition is to actually plot EC values. And you can see on this plant here, or the, the plot here, that the, the EC values are varying over time. And specifically, when you look at the green zone there, the EC values are pretty flat line. That indicates that the demand by the plant is being met by what you're applying. If it's increasing over time, what you have instead is an accumulation, so it's too much fertility. So in reality, doing something in the rate of 200 part per million or less fulfills the needs of that plant for plant growth. And so basically going through looking at the, the end results is that, you know, you can go as down as far as 100 part per million, but if you go lower, you probably will get some lower leaf yellowing occurring if you want to maximize growth around 200 part per million. And so you can, you can play with that rate a little depending on how much growth that you actually want to have with that plant. So uh, at the end, I'm going to show you a reference that if you want to download it as a PDF, but we also then plotted tissue values. Here's the one I'm showing for nitrogen concentration. And so the other elements are also listed in the particular guide uh, that if you are going to do tissue analysis, you'll have some standards to look at over time uh, to compare it if you're doing that with the plants. So the second question we had was, can we manage the growth? And so the, the obvious thing that we would look at is how to optimize PGR rates. And so we did a series of experiments for that. We used two chemicals, Piccolo, which is paclobutrazole, and Concise, which is uniconazole. And you can see there that we did some liner soaks and the rates are there. We did some foliar sprays and we also did substrate drenches. So we basically did four rates of each of those two chemicals with those three different application methods. And the other details are there at the bottom if you want to look at that a little later. So what did we find? So you can see here if you do pre-plant liner soaks that you do get good growth control. The untreated is the plant on the left and then you see a good rate of piccolo and a good rate of concise, eight and one part per million respectively. We also looked at the effects of pinching and not pinching because it's kind of recommended to pinch. And so, you know, with that PGR, well, with a pinch, of course, the plants are just a little smaller, but there's a possibility there that you can replace that pinch with a PGR application and um, um, uh, do it instead of going through and pinching the plant. So one, one word of advice, these are rates for North Carolina. These were holding the plants pretty small. So if you're further north, I would suggest that you half the rates on that. And then if you don't want a complete set of control for the entire season, you could even go a little lower because you can follow up with a foliar spray later on if you so desire, but once you've committed to a PGR rate, sometimes, you know, if it's too much, you're going to have to come back with a, like a fresco or fasc fascination application. So on foliar sprays, they worked, you know, piccolo at 75, concise at 20. You can use slightly lower rates if you want to hold the growth down or not have a little more growth, uh, but they weren't quite as effective as far as giving the growth control as one would expect with, um, uh, with a liner soak or a drench. And then finally, when you looked at substrate drenches, we did pickle, you know, piccolo at two part per million worked well and concise at one part per million also worked well. This held the plant small. Maybe you don't want quite that much control, so then start 
cutting the rate back to try to fine tune things that work for your operation. So it worked very well on all of these all these rates uh, that we found on this experiment. So one other sideline I might note, we have done a little work with Agio. We actually did some Agio liner soaks, and I can tell you Lobularia does not like Agio as far as a liner soak. Now we haven't done foliar sprays or drenches, uh, so just be uh, forewarned on that and probably do a little trial. Basically you'll see a meltdown of the plant uh, because of the effects of that if, it, if, it's, if it's not going to work for those other application methods for those plants. And so the other question we had when we were looking at uh, trying to get a better quality plant is can we increase irrigation efficiency on that plant? And so, you know, indirectly we answered this question. And that is that we found that by managing the growth with uh, that also we increase the water use efficiency because a plant that's been treated with the plant growth regulator uses less water. And because of that, the plant does not use as much water, so it didn't wilt. And when the plant did not wilt, you did not have the overall yellowing that occurs, especially with the big monster plants. Because if it's a big monster plant and you get lower leaf or interior yellowing, you're going to have to start thinking it's more of a problem of irrigation uh, 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 situation going on versus a nitrogen deficiency happening on that particular plant. And so you can kind of use that also as a diagnostic key of figuring out is it nitrogen or is it a water stress. And, and remember, and, and I didn't realize this when we started, but lobularia is, uh, uh, is in the uh, crucifera family, like cabbage, like cauliflower. So what happens with cauliflower if you water stress it? It premature flowers or forms the head. So you get a nice little miniature three inch tall cauliflower plant with a, a half an inch wide cauliflower in it. So you get your baby cauliflowers, but it's, it's not exactly what you want. Well, anything in that family does not like water stress. And that's what we're in fact doing with it. And, and if you really look at, you want to look at this plant a little more in depth, and I call this plant a big baby. And that's because it likes a lot of water, it, takes, it can take a lot of fertility, it can grow big, but as soon as something goes wrong, it really shows it. So, and it's very reactive also to PGRs. It, do, it doesn't take a lot to have a, a big effect on that plant. So, you know, it can be very effectively controlled with a plant growth regulator application. So, the overall summary is that by using a PGR, you're going to control a lot of that excess growth and you're not going to have the need to have to water it as much as an untreated plant. So it's a good production practice for you to consider uh, for growing these plants. So then over the last few years, we've also been growing the plants either in our research or it's been in the, the um, um, uh, the trials here at NC State, and so I always been scouting them looking for other problems. So I want to share with you some of the other problems that we actually have run into with the plant. Now this is from our research. We found that Lobularia does not like Judo, or maybe I should say Judo doesn't like Lobularia. And so the irony is, and luckily it occurred first during hot temperatures, the chem the judo was applied and we had the meltdown of the plant on the left and it came very quickly. And then because of that growth effect happened, you see the distorted effect occurring as, as symptoms advance. So it looks almost like a boron deficiency. It looks like a herbicide damage that's going on. So luckily when it first happened to us, it, it, was, it was the summer. So it came quickly when we can pinpoint it back to the problem. But then in the fall, I wanted to repeat it to confirm it. And, and so we had the greenhouse manager spray the plants and it's like, well, this is, it, there's no symptoms. It's not working. It must not have been the problem. It took two weeks for the damage to show up in the fall versus the spring. Or, or I should say in the cold weather, it took two weeks to manifest symptoms where it was four week, or, or two days to manifest it in the, in the warmer weather. So the, the take home here is that lobularia and judo don't mix, so don't make those applications to the plants. 
There's also reported in the literature that fasciation of the stem. Now that stem, I, I can tell you, that's only about three inches long. So that's not a it's it's a big thickening that occurs. And so basically, it's it's really genetic drift. And so I had to look long and hard in the garden here at NC State to find one sprout that did that. So it can occur. It's just genetic, and it's not really a, a major problem with this plant, but it, it has been reported by other people. There are a number of pests that can be a problem. The diamondback moth is on the left, and you can kind of see it's an, almost an hourglass uh, shape of, of light cream with the rest of the wing being black uh, for you can help diagnose it. And if the, if the caterpillar is there, the caterpillar is basically about a little over a quarter of an inch long. If you touch it many times, it will drop on a string down the ground if you can find it. But, you know, lobularia is not a very tall plant, but that, that's how you can diagnose that. Tarnished plant bug can also feed on it because they, they like cabbage plants, but I haven't seen enough damage that you would say it's a, it's a major pest that's gonna be uh, one that curtails uh, uh, the good quality plant growth. Uh, flea beetle on the, on the left, we also ran into a little leaf miner. Again, minor pest, normal spray rotation is going to take care of it. Now here's one though you need to be aware of, harlequin bugs. So they have the, the black and orange coloration. And these, these insects have some of the neatest eggs. They're hexagonal shape. And if you look sideways at them, they are black and white bands. And so they're really cool. They, they usually lay them two, two rows of eggs side by side, and it's probably about six eggs long. So they're offset because they're hexagon. And those, those particular bugs, because they have a piercing sucking mouth part, they basically inject toxin and you'll see the overall meltdown of that plant like you see in the background. And so we've been fighting that down here in North Carolina in some of the landscape situations. And so I just wanted to make you aware that that can also end up being a problem. pH wise, uh, the plant's pretty darn tolerant of a wide range of pHs. If it gets too low, lower leaf yellowing occurs as you see on on the, uh, the photo on the left, and you'll get the intervenal chlorosis if the pH gets too high. One side note, we use that proven winter formulation with that added chelated iron. That gave us another half a unit higher pH until we saw symptoms. So the, at, that extra iron was beneficial to avoiding intervenal chlorosis on that plant. So, Overall, when you look at cultural information in the, in the proven winter cultural guides that are out there, they do recommend a pH of 6 to 6.5, and I think that, that's a pretty good range for that plant. You could probably go down to 5.8 with no problem. I, I wouldn't, because of iron chlorosis, I wouldn't go much on the upper side of 6.5, though, on that plant when you're trying to end up growing it. Some other miscellaneous things, purpling of the lower foliage. This is during propagation. Uh, you can see phosphorus deficiency, and because uh, this is in the cabbage family, uh, sulfur is uh, in higher demand by a plant in that family, and you can get an overall yellowing of that plant if you hold it down and this this hold it back. And this this was our nutrient deficiency that we ran at the NC State system. We we have, and we, we certainly did get a good good crop of, of sulfur deficiency there. So. Uh, the only other thing that, you know, Ray, with Raymond talking, he did remind me of one thing. It was odd that we had some plants in the greenhouse. I normally scout looking at the flowers on Lobularia, looking for thrips, and I never found them, never found them. That we were having a, an outbreak in the small greenhouse, and I finally realized after looking at some plants, the thrips were primarily feeding on the stems which is kind of odd because they really prefer the pollen. They weren't in the flower. So, so just keep in mind, if you're scouting for thrips on lobularia, make sure you look at the stems when you're doing that type of a, a scouting program. So with finishing up, uh, we did produce a guide. And so you see the website that's listed there. That's with the Proven, Win uh, uh, Proven Winner website. Uh, last night, we also loaded it up on the eGrow 
uh, .org website. It's listed under the, the research tab that it's up there. It's about a nine megabyte, uh, 20, I think 24 page uh, guide that has a lot of these photographs and, and it kind of covers what we found out. So it's a free download if you're interested in that information. So with that, I will open it up for questions. All right, um, Brian, can you hear me okay now? Brian, yes, I can. You can, okay. So the question is, any experience using Bonsai or Florel on Snow Princess? Um, well, Piccolo is a paclobutrazole, so that would give you a similar, um, you can use those same rates. And so all those photographs on the PGR experiment are in that that Snow Princess guide. That if you want to uh, if you want to download it, um, so the rates are there and, and it's on the slide. So that works there. Now, did I use Florel? I have to admit I don't remember. Uh, I might have. Um, I do believe it did not like it as well. And and again. It, that type of plant, anything in the cabbage family doesn't like stress. And in Florel, Colate, whatever you're using, both of those induce a stress. And I think we got some lower leaf yellowing and it wasn't quite the result we wanted. So I would probably recommend uh, not using it, but I don't remember if we did the trial. So I would suggest that you um, uh, conduct a small trial yourself. You're going to see within a week whether or not uh, you're getting the yellowing, and I think you're going to get it. Okay. Um, a, a question is, uh, didn't Proven Winter release a compact variety last year called potentially White Knight? Uh, I believe they did. Um, they have a number of them in the series. Uh, no, sorry, I'm thinking differently here. I'm thinking Euphorbia. Uh, I think they did a little more of a compact variety also. So in that that case, you, you know, we we only did the work on Snow Princess, so you're you're a little unknown territory as far as the rate. So you definitely will need to cut them back. Okay, and does anybody else have any other questions that that uh, ask Brian Whipker about? Um, Growing Snow Princess. All right, Brian. Two down. One more for you to go after I, if I, after I get done speaking here in a couple of minutes. So uh, um, we'll we'll take a, a short break um, at about uh, um, two o'clock. Uh, we'll come back um, and uh, um, I'll be talking about uh, fertilization and, and PGR uses on osteosperma. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.